Now this class is really more of an open format class where you guys get to essentially pick what you would like to learn. I welcome any questions having to do with any TMAs on pro training, anything having to do with WordPress, or even simply something having to do with your Amazon affiliate site in general. Feel free to just type your questions into the chat box at any time and be more than happy to answer them. Hello, Joseph. Oh, um, Joseph, I received your questions that you were asking about. Got your uh, email, so be happy to cover those for you now that I know you are indeed here. While I'm covering some of these questions for Joseph, I will uh, be sure to let you guys know what it is that I am trying to address for him so you can follow along and know what's going on as well. And also feel free to punch your questions in that you may have at any point in time if you would like for me to cover something else when I am finished. Now, one of the main questions you seem to be having, Joseph, was about siloing and putting that into effect on your website in terms of your permalink structure and also options that may be available in SEO Ultimate. In a lot of ways, the strategies that I use for building my sites, the things that I've taught in a lot of the previous classes have covered this type of thing in terms of structuring your website. I don't really use a lot of the terms like siloing and things just in case people don't really understand what those terms actually mean. But I still essentially build my websites in that same manner. One of the things that I do not always do is what you were asking about with the permalinks. Pull up a permalink page here. You were asking about which is better in terms of using the normal post name structure or putting the category name in front of it. So you are talking about this structure. This is typically what a lot of people would be referring to in terms of siloing, at least having to do with your web page URLs. But siloing is really more also about how you're structuring the content on your own website and keeping essentially separate containers of content that each have to do with a particular subject, which is something that I recommend to do when I am building my websites. Now, whether or not you use this within your URL structure, number one can honestly be up to you if you already have a site that is built. Trying to go backwards and switching a site over to using this category structure can sometimes be a little more of a headache than it's worth than if you are doing it from the get-go. If you are setting up your site from scratch and you're deciding which one to pick, if you are wanting to go for a highly structured silo type of website, then it is okay to use it. I have used both before and I've achieved top search rankings using either format, honestly. So I don't necessarily have a preference in terms of which one is better for search engine optimization sake, but I usually end up recommending 
for people to simply go with the normal host name structure simply because it is easier to go ahead and do this than to have to worry about connecting up all of the other pieces. Okay, you did go through that change and it's not a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it can be a bit of a headache to figure out all the parts that need to connect up with each other. Um, some of the main things that come into play with that is when you are putting the category in front of the post name, you're then competing with other pages on your site that might end up having the same structure. And this is also true when people remove the uh, category and tag base. You are asking about SEO Ultimate and some of the settings that it has available for this type of thing. If you go to the miscellaneous page under SEO, there are a couple of things here that can help you with what I'm just talking about. You can remove the URL bases of categories, for example. So you would have downcomfortguide.com slash and then whatever the category name is instead of having category slash and then the category name. So when you're setting up the permalink structure, if you are using the category, somebody could essentially remove the post name portion of the URL and that would take them back to the category page. Well, the only way of setting that up is to remove the URL bases. But then a lot of people still run into the issue of conflicts. Um, there is this URL conflict resolution setting that is available. By its default setting, it being set to the term archive, it may not correctly pull the right page that you want it to. A lot of people will try to create their own WordPress page to replace a category page that's actually generated through the post section. Well, if you are doing that and simply trying to get that new page to overwrite the existing category page, you can sometimes accomplish that. You would definitely want to change this setting to page though instead of term archive. So in a lot of cases, if I was going to set all this up, I would definitely be checking the categories here to remove the base. I would switch this to page and over on permalinks, then I would add category. Now you still run into some other things that may potentially cause you problems. You have to sometimes worry about your menus and your category links that automatically show up on the website and your breadcrumbs. But if you're creating a page that has the same slug as your category, what I mean by that is, I'll open these up in two different windows so I can show you. So this would be my slug. I will call it slug. And over here on the category page, I will create a new category called slug. And as you can see, this is the actual slug for that category. So whatever your slug is, you would then want to create a page that had the same name as that category. Then these settings would help to overwrite that. So this conflict resolution would then resolve it to your page instead. So then what you would want to do with this page here is set it to a page with post template. And you have to publish it before you can actually go through and modify the settings on these. Once you have it set as a page with post template, as long as you're using the Weaver 2 theme that I recommend to use. And you can go down below in these settings with 
for the page with post template and simply set your category so I could set this as slug. And you have some other different options here if you want to try to tweak the way that all gets displayed. So then you would have all of your posts created as a WordPress post and you assign it to the category slug. And then it would all show up at the bottom of this page and yet you could still have your own customized content here up at the top. So that would essentially be the main parts of the process that you would need to go through to try to set that up to work in that manner. There are really a bunch of different ways that you can go, go about trying to structure your site though. And there's not necessarily a right or a wrong way to do it. It's really all about picking away and sticking to that format. And one way or another, you still need to try to structure your site to get better rankings. Now, one of the other questions you had was whether Amazon links should be nofollow links or not. I always recommend to make them nofollow. My plugins that create Amazon links, they also make the product links nofollow as well. The reasoning behind this is to stop Google from indexing that link on your site. But the main idea behind that is to stop your page rank from leaving your site and going off to the page on Amazon. Now a lot of people have maybe thought that it disguises the link or keeps Google from realizing that you have an affiliate link or something like that. That's really not the case. Honestly, using things like no follow on a link is not going to keep Google from actually checking out that link. A lot of times they'll still check it out just to try to see what it is that you're linking up to, even if they don't end up transferring some power from your site to that site through that link. So in that regard, one way or another, I still recommend to use it. It's still good practice to use on your affiliate links. There are some cases where I recommend building links on your site and not making that the case to where you want them to be links that Google can follow. And those would be more of your relational authority type of links. And those can actually be beneficial to you. Find pages that Google respects within your niche and link up to them from a relevant page on your own site using a keyword phrase that you're trying to target. Little things like this can actually be a lot of help in terms of building SEO, but for affiliate links. Okay, cool. Now, your other question here about for SEO purposes, categories and tags, how does all that play in? In general, what I will do through the SEO plugin, I think I have this open, yes, on this window here. Through the SEO plugin, if you go to the Meta Robots, Meta Robot Tags page, you can choose different sections of your site that are going to get indexed by Google or not. Now, depending on how you build your site is going to kind of determine what you should be setting up here in terms of what you don't want to have indexed. In almost all cases, I would recommend preventing indexing of tags. And in a lot of cases, I would also recommend preventing the indexing of categories. But again, it really depends on how you are structuring your site and what parts of WordPress you are using. 
basically what you want to think about is this. Any page on your site that contains most of the content on that page can be found on another page on your site. You want to prevent Google from indexing all but one of those pages that have that very similar or the exact same content. So this is where the tag archives comes into play. In most cases, the tag archives pages are simply going to be duplicates of the category pages. Maybe they'll have a little bit of mixing and matching of the actual posts that are shown there, but in terms of 90 to 95% of the content on the whole page is going to end up being identical. And this is especially the case if you have posts where you assign a number of different tags to them. You can have tag pages that are essentially identical to other tag pages with the exception of just a couple of words like the actual tag name. So yet another reason why I'm usually always preventing the indexing of tag archives. Now again, this would still only apply if you're using posts and categories on your site. If you're using nothing but pages, the site that I'm actually on at the moment, Down Comforter Guide here, this site uses, uses nothing but pages. So I actually don't have to prevent the indexing of category and tag pages in that case. No, there's, there's really no harm in not having tags. Um, I've actually gotten more into the habit of going that route when I am building a site out of post these days. I'll simply not use tags unless I feel like it's really necessary to reemphasize some keyword phrases that you might be trying to target on that page. That's really one of the only cases where I can see using the tags when essentially they're not going to have any real use could possibly come in handy. Some other people will use it for organizing their website in terms of they'll create a tag cloud or something to point people to different parts of their content that all relate to a particular subject. But I really think that as long as you're going about organizing your content properly into categories, then you don't really have a need for using the tags. So I definitely would say that there is not harm in completely avoiding the tags. Now with the, with the category archive page, these, if you were actually utilizing the real category pages that WordPress creates when you create a category through the post system, if you are using that page on your site and it's the only page where all of those posts are listed at, then you can still allow the category archives to get indexed. However, if you are creating your own custom category pages that are going to overwrite the default ones, then you would definitely want to prevent indexing of the category archives. That, that's a good question, uh, Iqbal. Do we allow comments because it is creating a lot of spam? You don't have to allow comments on your site. There are a lot of my WordPress sites where I simply disable the comments altogether. If you are in a niche or creating content pages that are prone to strike up conversation, a lot of times this is going to be your more controversial types of subjects. Then 
you might want to allow the commenting because you may get some real comments that come in. A lot of the times though, you'll find that m pretty much all the comments, 99% or more that are coming into your site are nothing but spam. And I've tracked this down before. The people never even visit your site. They're not even punching that information in through that comment box on your web page. They're simply using software to detect domain names that are running WordPress and then they just beam these comments out to these pages from their own website with never actually visiting your site. So there definitely is an issue there with comment spam and, and for that reason I don't use them in a lot of cases. Uh, yes, typically, Joseph, I will enter keywords into the SEO area of each post. I assume you're talking about um, down here in the, uh, that's what I use the keyword statistics plugin for. It has a meta keyword area where I can either have it generated based off of my content or if there are definitely particular phrases that I'm going after I will I will punch them in here it's not gonna give you major benefits in terms of SEO and it's definitely not gonna keep you off of getting onto page one of Google if you don't do the keywords they're definitely something that is been phased out quite a bit over the years. However, Google will still look at it and other search engines will still look at it and they'll kind of take it as like a suggestion and if they agree with you then they will uh, definitely put you there. It may give you a minor boost for for having it. But I've I've done again sites that have used it and sites that have completely ignored the meta keywords and still had success with either method. So I've, I've never really determined one or another to work or not work. Now the title in the description, Joseph, I do pay a little more attention to them. I actually have on this site, I have this plugin set up to only use the meta keywords and actually do the title tag and the description from the SEO settings here because then I'm also typically reproducing this information in this social networks listing. These are actually pretty important. The reason why is because these can end up showing up on the search engines so you can kind of have some control over what the title is going to be in the search engine rankings. And this can definitely affect how many people end up clicking through. Let's see, Kent, let me answer your question for you here real quick. Yes, yes, Kent, I am recording this and I will end up setting up a section in the members area once I have the replay of this ready and especially for those of you that have been asking questions as we go along you'll be able to refer back to this in the future if you would like and usually if you're asking a question there's often other people out there that have the exact same question having to do with these sites, so 
others will find the answers useful as well. Iqbal, the theme that I recommend is Weaver 2. I have a lot of training having to do with this theme in T Team Azon Pro, in Azon Masterclass 1 and Masterclass 2. And then there's also a separate Weaver training that is available there. You can find that theme for free. Just go to Appearance and Themes, and you can search for it by going to the Add New page. And then just type in Weaver 2. It's 2 with eyes and not actually the number 2. I use this for a large majority of the sites that I build. I'm I'm trying to think of the last time I actually built a site and did not use Weaver 2. I think for the last, I would say a solid two years or so, I've built every single site that I make is based off of Weaver 2. And this is for my Amazon affiliate sites, my commercial plugin and training sites, Team Amazon Pro, I believe is also utilizing Weaver 2 as well. Kent, um, when will this training end? I had originally scheduled it to be an hour, so from 7 to 8 p.m. However, I am really not that picky about my ending time. If there are still questions that you guys have that you would like answered. I don't have a problem at all sticking around longer and making sure I cover everything you would like to know. Hi Lee, good to see you there. I heard from Linda Lee that you are going to be going to the uh, marketing conference in Atlanta in March. Why can't I think of the name of it right now? It's a it's affiliate related. I have too many conferences rolling around in my head. Just got back from Marketing Mayhem in Orlando not too long ago. I picked up a ticket for that as well, Lee, and I'm planning on going, so it'd be cool to meet you and Linda in person. Yeah, I'll definitely be there. I'm, I'm only about two, two and a half hours or so away from Atlanta, and my wife's father lives in Atlanta as well. So making a trip there is a fairly easy trip to make. Kathleen... Um, one of my plugins hasn't been updated in a while. Does it cause problems? In most cases, it doesn't actually. It just kind of depends on what WordPress does in terms of their updates. Before I ever started building WordPress plugins, I did a lot of learning in terms of the proper way to build WordPress plugins because I was already very experienced with programming so I just kind of needed to learn that other part to figure out how to make the plugins correctly and I saw there were a lot of junk plugins out there which was part of what drove me to end up creating commercial plugins in the beginning so I try to make my plugins based on functions and features that are built into the WordPress system and to try to do things the correct way as opposed to with programming you can usually 
accomplish any one thing a number of different ways. So I try to go about it the right way, and this has definitely helped me in terms of my plugins not going out of date. I do check them on a regular basis, and uh, like right now, I believe I have a couple of minor glitches that have showed up with WordPress 4.0, but as far as I'm aware, I've not found anything that is not functioning at all, and that is something that it's kind of a constant battle in a way, but in a lot of ways, as long as the plugin was made correctly, then you usually don't run across too many of those problems. Uh, yes, William, I likely will do some Christmas niche training. actually haven't gotten to the niche training for Team Azon Pro yet. That'll end up being released within the next week or so, the first niche training. I'm going to be covering obviously specific niches, but you know, I'm going to do some different seasonal types of niches as well to help out with training in those areas and giving you some of my recommendations for going about targeting products and getting traffic to them. So there will be a variety of those. Um, the Christmas training, I will plan to, to do that one in October just to give you guys enough of a head start on all of that. Uh, Joseph, membership plugin option suggestion. I use, I don't have it on this site, I use it on uh, S2 member. Team Azon Pro is based on S2 member. It's, um, it's free, they have a pro version. I actually just use the free version, although if there's not something a free version can do, I, I typically, typically just program my own solution. But um, S2 member is actually really, really nice in terms of what it can do for free. Uh, Yousef, you're asking about images pulled from Amazon, if it will consider that duplicate or not. I would not consider that to be duplicate um, in terms of the way, the way a search engine looks at duplicate content is they're looking at mostly the text content of the pages that are on your site. So what they're looking for is that they don't want to see that you're reusing the same content over and over and over again on your website. Because you could obviously write one page of content and create 10,000 copies of that same page and try to make it look like you had a really large website. So that's when the whole Google duplicate content penalty would kick in, Yousef. So you're not necessarily looking to avoid content that could be found elsewhere on the internet or even images that might be found elsewhere on the internet. Google can still definitely figure out when content or images on your site might be found elsewhere online. And it definitely would not give you as much of a ranking boost with that content as it would completely unique content. But with that said, it also doesn't mean that using that kind of content on your own site is going to cause you problems. I still recommend having some of your own unique content to make your site different. You know, Google needs to see something there that's a reason why your site is different from everyone else's. Now your, I guess the other part of your question here was 
where can you find some affordable product images? There's actually a number of ways that you could go about doing that. You could try websites like Fiverr or freelancing websites or possibly even sites like Craigslist where you're essentially looking for people that might already own the product and maybe they'd be willing to snap a couple unique pictures of it for you or maybe they'd be willing to shoot a quick demonstration video for you. I'm actually planning on eventually getting to some training having to do with outsourcing and using that for some unique high quality content and video creation types of strategies a little further into the future but all that will also be part of TMAs on Pro. Um, no Lee, unfortunately I don't have comments on HostGator viability in there and their poor customer service. I'm I've been I've been tempted to try to start my own hosting company, but I dabbled in that once upon a time and, and it's it's really a lot. It's it's a very time consuming business, so probably not something that I would get into. I am hunting for a better solution. Hostgator in terms of their servers are really not too bad. When you get everything working correctly and you're all up and running, then things really aren't that bad. The problems are really coming up once you actually need something from them. When something goes wrong and, you know, like you're talking about when you have to contact customer support, then is kind of when you end up running into the uh, issues with them. And I, I know most of you are probably on their shared hosting. I, I have both uh, shared and dedicated hosting with HostGator. They used to be awesome for you know, across the board for all account types. Then they kind of seemed to scale back with the shared hosting and they were still really attentive with the dedicated hosting and honestly now it, it it even sometimes takes me two or three days to get a decent reply from them or to get anything resolved which unfortunately is not very ideal when it comes to internet marketing and running your own websites um, to be continued though Lee I'm still on the hunt Um, Mal G, will I ever do a course on building plugins? I thought about it once upon a time and I kind of fished to see how much demand there might be from my existing customers, but it's really more of a specialty kind of market in terms of building plugins and might be something that I'll eventually do, but at least for now, it is not currently something I have planned. Uh, Yusuf, Azon Publishers, I think you're talking about, yeah, Azon Publishers Studio plugin. Um, unfortunately, it is currently only for Amazon.com. They have that feature added as a beta feature for Amazon.com affiliates right now. And so I would assume that they will eventually roll that out to other countries, but at least as far as I'm aware, they have not done so yet. I would assume that's going to be maybe even after it's out of beta with Amazon.com. However, if they do eventually change that and make it available for the other countries, I will definitely update is on Publisher Studio and make it compatible with the other countries. Yeah, that's that's it. Both of you, um, Lee and 
James Nams, that is the conference I was talking about. Yeah, that's I'll I'll be going, James. That's cool to hear that somebody else here is gonna be going. That's that's three people now. That's awesome. I have to keep an eye out for you. I always wear if you've ever seen my pictures online, my my kind of baby blue NC Tar Heels hat. I always wear those whenever I go to conferences and uh, helps me to stand out and well for people that know me helps them to be able to find me. Um, Mal, that's a good question too. While I include the video training in the members area that I offered today as a bonus to the ready-made videos, a large majority of that training is specifically for that product. In general, that's probably going to be the one type of training that I really do that might not be available for Team on Pro members, but in most cases it's really just because it's not something that would really apply, you know, unless you happen to own the product. However, there, there are some things now and again that are included as bonus training like that that are not specific to a product, things like that I will definitely be including. Um, let's see, Lee. I... I have a good answer for that, if you give me one moment. Lee's asking about finding free images. Try pixabay.com. This site says free and it actually means free. They do have advertisements on it, but I find it to be something that has a lot of variety that you can actually download for free. And what you want to be a little careful about here, I'll just type in a word, type in horse. We'll find a picture of a horse. First of all, you have up at the top your Shutterstock images. These are advertisements, sponsored images. So everything that doesn't have the little X's over it, all of these are the images. And they have everything from real life images to, you know, cartoony animation type of stuff. Now they do, if you're trying to download these full resolution images, they do ask that you sign up for an account and log in. I've actually never even created an account. I'm assuming they still allow you to download these for free, you know, the, the larger files. However, if you just go to either the small or the medium size, the small size they'll usually just let you download outright. The medium size they'll usually give you a little captcha to punch in. So you type in the number and then you can download it. And then I think for the extra large and the vectors, they require a login on those two. This is probably my more favorite free image site. Iqbal, that is a good question. If you add color or text on the image, does that make it unique? I can't really say for sure if 
Google could detect that or not. It is possible that they could. I've, I've seen some TV shows that have led me to believe that either Google could be involved in the technology or if not right now that they could have access to it in the coming next couple of years. They've basically reverse engineered the brain and how it reacts to images of different things. And so now they've been building this database that they can just simply feed a picture into and a computer can tell them what that picture is of. So in that regard, I don't think, e even if it works now, I don't think it would work forever adding some color or text to an image to make it unique. For now, it definitely, I'll leave it at a maybe, it could. The only thing you kind of want to be careful about there is simply getting into copyright laws. You would not want to take an image off of Amazon, for example, and overlay text on it and reuse it on your own website. They, they could construe that as, you know, commercial modification and uh, that would not be okay. However, things like going to a site like Pixabay and taking images that are okay to reuse and even modify to your heart's content, those, you know, would be a better choice for doing something like that. Um, Joseph, I, I cannot guarantee that it would. He's asking if, if putting an intro in a, was that out of stock? A little, a spin on them. Oh, I see the, the video spinner. Will it make them enough for YouTube? It quite possibly could. Um, I haven't tested it with a wide enough variety of things to really be able to answer that question accurately. It, it could be worth a try though, just do it with one video and you won't like get your YouTube account um, in trouble or anything like that for giving it a shot with one. They would simply tell you when you try to upload a little message will come up saying that, you know, you just can't upload it, that it exists already. So it could be worth a shot to try spinning it to see if it would be good enough to put up on YouTube. I'm also going to be getting into some video courses in terms of creating your own videos from scratch as Team Azon Pro progresses, especially for those of you that don't want to actually be talking on a video or having to record you doing something on a website or record you in person or something of that nature. There are some other options like the, uh, the whiteboard videos and stuff like that. I have some plans on doing some training in that area as well in the coming months. Uh, for right now, Mal HostGator is the only host that I use. I've actually been with them, wow, I'm not even sure how many years. I would say, I'd say more than 10 years now, I've had some kind of account or another with HostGator. And back when I first started with them, they were amazing and more lately, I think their servers are still essentially just as good as they used to be, but their their customer support is nowhere near 
what it used to be. That's kind of the part that's gone downhill and is definitely making me consider just completely moving everything to another company. Uh, Iqbal, what is WordPress multi-site option? That's a good question. Um, might not be something that I could completely demonstrate here because it kind of would take a little bit of setup. Um, however, I can give you the basis of it. When you are installing WordPress, before you ever actually run the installation script, this would be when you're manually uploading the files. So not through control panels quick install, for example. That does it all automatically. If you're doing a manual installation, before you proceed with the actual installation part, you can edit a configuration file and change WordPress to be installed as a multi-site setup instead. The main difference with normal WordPress and multi-site WordPress though is that with multi-site you get to run multiple WordPress websites. I'm talking about completely separate sites and they can be on different domain names. You can run them all from one single WordPress dashboard. You essentially select the site that you want to be working on and then you work on that site as normal how you would with the uh, WordPress features and different menus that are available to you. Now one of the main hang-ups with WordPress multi-site is that you have to have all of those websites on the same web server. So for a lot of people, they might think that, you know, well, I could just run all my different websites off of it. And unfortunately, it's not the case. It would be pretty cool if it worked that way. And I've debated trying to make something that would allow it to work in that manner because I have some suspicions as to how I could make that work. But in terms of how WordPress multi-site actually works, it presents some problems for people. Sometimes software, the plugins or themes that you buy, they may or may not be compatible with multi-site. But if you do get to the point where you're running a lot of sites and you simply get tired of having tons of different logins that you have to do to manage each of those sites. Trying to set up WordPress multi-site can be helpful, but again, it's really something you kind of have to decide to do from the get-go. If, if you want to go back at a later point in time and change a normal site to a multi-site installation, it's, it's really not that simple. Um, th there are some software solutions that have been created out there that um, more of a, I think most of them are like backup plugins that work in that manner and they can sometimes transfer a normal WordPress site to a multi-site installation and vice versa. But without that kind of extra software you're pretty much stuck with whatever you initially decide to do. Let's see, Yousef, you are asking about sites built in the Italian language. Do I think it's right to build links the same we do in English? It's hard to find links in Italian language. Are you talking about like uh, building backlinks to your site in that manner. 
I, I've never personally built a site in a foreign language. I only know English, so unfortunately that's kind of a bit of a drawback area where I don't really have a definitive answer for you. Um, I, I would definitely keep your, your links in the same language as your website language though, simply because I don't really think Google is going to mix and match the two. I very, very rarely end up seeing uh, Spanish pages, for example, showing up in my Google search results. So I think Google has a very fine definition there. If you can't find your own Italian links that you can build, you might need to essentially build your own. You could possibly still do it from some of your major websites, whether they're nofollow links or do follow links, links from places like uh, Facebook and YouTube can still help a site, in my opinion. <laughs> do, do I think the time will come when websites will be dead and video takes over? Um, I don't know. It's It's possible, I suppose. I think that would still be years and years away. They'd, they would need technology to really analyze a video with a computer and to be able to tell exactly what people are talking about in the video and exactly what's being shown in the video. And I think until they can kind of reach that point with technology, then content websites will definitely still be around and even even beyond that point I still think that they would survive I don't I don't think it will ever go truly a hundred percent video realistic earnings to expect from a well put together Amazon website Mal it really is going to depend on a couple of factors. How big your site is, what niche of products you're going after, and a lot of times more importantly the price of those products. Sometimes the usage of those products. You have some really expensive products that are used up and somebody has to buy again in some niches, whereas other niches you have an expensive product that is purchased and somebody won't buy that same product again for maybe five or ten years. So there are differences that I found when it comes to what you're actually trying to target that can definitely affect what you earn. But a, a wide range that I typically will tell people is 50 upwards of $200 a month from a single site. And this is more for the static page type of website, like Down Comforter Guide is. If you have an even larger site, something you're updating on a daily basis, you know, it's definitely feasible to get above that $200 a month mark. But I don't really expect to ever hit that on a site that I plan on simply building and leaving it to sit there. You know, I've, I've, I've heard D9 mentioned a couple of times, Lee. I know, you, I know, I'm pretty sure you've mentioned it to me once before, and um, some others have mentioned it as well. My, my one hang-up with switching to 
somebody like D9 is simply that they're located in the UK, I would definitely prefer to stick with a US based server since I'm located there and large majority of my customers both on my product development and training end of my business and also with my affiliate websites most of my customers are located in the US so I do try to stick in the same region in that regard with where my server is located at if I'm trying to get search rankings for that same region I do believe that is something that Google looks at not to say that they couldn't put a website located in the UK ranking on google.com but I also dabble in some local marketing stuff as well as you can see with um, Azon Masterclass 3 for example so I think if you're ever trying to target something that's location based then it definitely becomes even more so important to have hosting located in the same country. Now, yeah, yeah, in, in most cases, Lee, it, it's not going to make a difference, the domestic versus the foreign hosting. But, you know, again, when you're, when you're trying to target certain groups of people sometimes, if, if you're going location-based, then I think it becomes pretty important instead of not really making much of a difference. Um, Mal, what hosting company would I recommend to go with for our new sites? Unfortunately right now the only recommendation that I have to go off of is HostGator in terms of what I personally use their shared hosting is not that expensive as long as you don't end up trying to set up special things or run into some type of you know extra problem there are some situations that end up kind of causing their own hosting problems um, HostGator can be good if you end up needing a lot of help with your hosting company they're not really uh, the best choice to go for. Unfortunately though I don't have a better US based recommendation for you. Um, Lee, Lee seems to really be enjoying D9 solutions but again they're located in, in the UK. Um, Howard, what is the difference in a money site, authority site, others? Um, it's really just about the tactic that you're using in terms of the actual site that you build and a lot of times also how you are bringing the traffic into that site. With a money site, for example, there are a lot of people that will create one-page websites. They'll register a domain name. It might be a particular model number of a TV, for example. They might go out and register the .com version of that domain and slap up a one-page website that's all about that one product and funnel traffic through their Amazon affiliate link. That type of site does convert traffic really well into sales. The problem that most people end up having with that type of a money site though is getting the traffic to the site. A lot of people end up needing a source of free recurring traffic and while there are a lot of strategies out there with how to go about getting that in various ways without using Google, I'm still a big fan of using Google in that manner simply because they're more dependable and they can really offer more traffic than a lot of the other options can at least 
sustainable traffic in, in my opinion. Now, an authority site would really be more of an informational type of site in terms of think of one topic like cars for example. How many different small specific topics could you possibly come up with relating to cars? Quite possibly millions or maybe even more than that. In my opinion at least, in order to be an authority site on a topic, you need to be covering more of the potential subtopics than all of the other competitors are. So in that regard, you can have an authority site about a really broad topic, or you can have more mini authority sites that just cover a very specific topic. For example, while you could have a site covering anything and everything about cars, you could also have another site that specifically covers 1970 Mustangs. Or maybe even more specific than that. Maybe it just covers one aspect of a particular type of car or something like that. I would still consider those to be authority sites as long as they're covering all the relevant information or more than all the other competitors are with that topic, whatever it is that they're going after. Personally, I'm more of a fan of the authority side approach, really more of the mini authority side approach, if you want to get into specifics about it, though. There are a lot of people that have a lot of success with simply doing the one-page money sites, but again, then your strategy is more about how you're driving traffic to that site and less about building the site itself. I just kind of prefer to put more of my work into the site that is actually going to be under my ownership instead of building a one-page site under my ownership and doing all this other stuff out there in other places on the internet that are ultimately going under the ownership of other people just to bring traffic to my one-page site. So while they both work, I simply prefer the more the mini authority approach. Joseph, how long does it take to get a site ranked flowing well realistically with free traffic? With Google at least, it can honestly depend. In, in some situations, you can get really good, strong traffic flowing on a regular basis to a website within a period of a week after you have started building a site. But then on other sites, it can sometimes take three months or six months or I've had some websites that I completely discounted and just thought, okay, maybe I did something wrong here and I just put it off to the side and ignored it for a while and a year or two later, all of a sudden, I'm getting great rankings on it. So there are some cases that kind of go either way in terms of some work out really, really fast and some work out much, much slower. I think it more comes down to how you build the site how much content you're putting on it, how many pages of content you're putting on a site. Larger sites that are updated more frequently will almost always get better rankings faster. The sites that I've had that have been able to pull in substantial amounts of traffic within a week of even registering the domain name some of those were more blog style type of websites where I was posting upwards of four to eight times a day on some of these sites and had a highly focused niche topic as well. But again, that's not really something that, you know, the average person is going to be doing. Most people end up building more of a static type of website. With them, if you do your keyword research correctly 
and target the lower competition phrases, you should be able to see some kind of traffic to your site within a month or two at the very most. If you're not seeing it within that kind of time period, you may have picked too broad of a niche. You may need more content on the pages of your site, or you simply may have picked keywords that were too competitive. Maybe they had too much available traffic for them and too many other people are also trying to compete for that same keyword phrase. Something you can do if you are having problems with a particular site. Go to the Google Keyword Tool and try to find a highly relational keyword phrase that you could try to target with a new page on your site. But go for a keyword phrase that's super, super low in traffic. I'm talking about under 100 monthly searches, maybe even 50 monthly searches. Build a page about that topic on your site and see if you can get in the rankings for it. See where you end up showing up. You can kind of do that with certain niches and determine where that sweet spot is in terms of the keywords that you can target that have low enough competition that are still going to allow you to get up in there and yet still offers enough traffic to make it worth your while. Uh, the, the least number of pages I would recommend for an Amazon site mal in most cases is I usually shoot for 20 as a minimum and there are a lot of cases where you may need to do more than that 30 40 50 um, I even have some Amazon sites that are a couple hundred pages in size so it just kind of depends on what fits with what your niche is really about as long as you are picking something that is focused enough then you shouldn't need to build much more than about 20 or 30 pages on a site to truly cover all the topics within that particular niche. Uh, Joseph, how to fix a thin content Amazon site. Um, the easiest thing to do is to add your own unique content and to reduce the number of pages. Uh, you have done a lot of modification. I would recommend looking at how many pages of content actually exist on your site that are those automated pages. And try to outnumber your automated content with your unique content. That's at least what I try to go for. I feel like if I'm outweighing it, then um, at least in my experiences, I, I have, haven't had any sites that were getting rankings and then got slapped by Google and disappeared from them in that manner. You can also look at, I don't know about in terms of the modification that you've done, whether it may be separate pages on your site in terms of um, you, if you create new, completely unique pages or whether you're going back into the existing pages with the automated content and trying to do some modification to those pages. At the very, very least, try to go into a page, 35% um, is sometimes a good number to go for. You want to have 35% of the content on any given page of your site to be unique content. There can be some exceptions to that where you have complete pages of automated content, but again, your, your unique content really should be outweighing your automated content one way or another.
in in some cases, Joseph, once Google has identified a site like that, getting it to reverse may not be as simple as actually doing the work that needs to be done on the site to get that reversed because they won't immediately just go index your site again and realize, hey, it's all changed and all better and I'm going to put them back where he used to be. You know, it's more of a case of it can sometimes simply take time if you're waiting for it to just kind of happen. If you truly believe that you have heavily modified your site to where it is now a completely unique and even useful website, then you can also sometimes appeal to Google to actually get them to take another look at it, to reconsider. You can just say, you know, something like, hey, I was installing some software that I was using as a basis for my website and was working on customization and modification to it and, you know, you guys got it indexed before that came along and, and you know, gave me this thin content penalty. Would you, you know, be able to take another look and reconsider? And there's no guarantees that they will or that you'll even get a reply from it. Um, I've not had to deal with that type of thing a lot myself, so I don't have a lot of specific recommendations beyond that, but I have heard um, some people that have had both success with it and, and others that have had essentially horror stories where it's just never possible to fix it. And if you can appeal to them at least and you can't get a reply or if they deny it, at least sometimes you can at least know, okay, I'm just going to forget about it and move on and start something new. Um, I can't remember the last time I've done that, Lee. That's a good question, though. See if I can figure that out real quick. Lee is asking how to contact Google to request those things. I would be looking probably on their about page, maybe even their business page. Um, honestly, I might be better off Googling for it. <laughs> oh, from web from Webmaster Tools, it's in there. Okay, jo Lee Joseph is saying that it is in Webmaster Tools and there's a way to, to contact them about that. You could also just look up, um, you know, on Google things like how to contact Google to request reconsideration of indexing something. Oh, and they, he says they do reply. That's, that's good to know. It's probably, it's probably been four or five years, I would guess, since the last time I actually attempted to contact Google having to do with anything with their search rankings. Oh, and they do reply, just not in your favor. Oh, I see. Did they, did they give you any pointers in terms of what you can do to fix it or if it's possible to fix, or did they give you the impression that you might just be better off moving on from it. Something I recommend to do, if you are building a website that is going to have some unique content and some automated content, I usually recommend to try to start with the unique content first, if it's ever possible to do so. There are some circumstances, um, I actually think the software you were using, Joseph, is one of those where essentially once you install the software, then you know you automatically have all of that duplicate content or automated content already in place. If that's the case, something that you can do is to use the WordPress setting to simply prevent your site from getting indexed by Google until you get to the point where you feel like it's ready for them to take a look at it. Uh, 
So all they all they gave you was just a link to info on thin content. Let's see, Lee, you were asking if I can provide comments about lead pages. Are you talking about for email newsletter leads? And your other question, do I have training on details of how to target keyword phrases? Hopefully, I was going on for a little while there about some things that you can do to try to fine-tune your targeting. Try to go for a bottom-of-the-barrel keyword phrase, for example, to see how high up you can actually go in your niche with keyword traffic before that competition takes over and becomes too difficult. And simply try to work below that level, whether it means, you know, personally I'd rather create two or three more pages of content to try to get the same potential amount of traffic as long as I can actually get those rankings. Whereas, you know, sure, it would be great to have rankings on phrases that have thousands of monthly searches, but in my eyes at least and from my experiences with trying to get some rankings on phrases like that in the past, the amount of work that it takes to get those cream of the crop phrases I don't feel like is really worth it compared to the small amount of work that can be done to get the really low traffic and low competition phrases. So I can turn out pages that are targeting these lower traffic keyword phrases a lot quicker than I can even just build one page and get it into a decent ranking on a really high traffic phrase. So I feel like I can reach that same high traffic level with many more pages quicker than I could by just trying to go after one amazing page and one amazing keyword. There are more details, you know, in terms of my keyword training in Azon Masterclass 1 and also in Azon Masterclass 2 and I guess even for that matter, I'll be I'll be covering some more advanced tactics in in Masterclass three. I believe the first class I I even started at least dipping into some of the more advanced tactics in terms of using uh, location based targeting and things of that nature to fine tune your results. I'm taking a look back through all these questions here. I believe I have covered everything that everybody has asked me so far, though. If I have missed anything that you have already asked me here, please feel free to bring it to my attention. I'd be more than happy to address that for you. Or if you have any new questions, please feel free to type those in at any time. While we're technically over time here, I don't mind sticking around if you guys would like to ask anything else. Um, Mal, I'm, I'm not the best person to ask for that information. He's asking what is the best keyword research tool. I actually don't use any. I use Google Keyword Planner, I use Google.com itself, I use Google Insights or Google Trends. I try to take that manual information that is out there and available to me and look at it in ways that, that other Amazon affiliates are not looking at it because ultimately I, I guess I tried keyword research tools many, many years ago, and I just didn't have a lot of success with them. You know, everything that it says is great ultimately takes a ton of work to actually get ranked for it. 
So unfortunately, I do not have specific recommendations there. Um, Iqbal, there, your, your question there with the video, if you're embedding other people's YouTube videos, for example, on your blog, can you put advertisements on the video or can you put links on their videos on your own blog and is that legal? In a lot of general cases where you are pulling the video off of somewhere like YouTube, something like that, in my opinion at least, I'm not technically a lawyer, um, but I, I feel like that is legal to do and something that I have done myself before. Most of the YouTube videos are essentially licensed to be reused in that manner. You can block people from being able to embed your video on other websites if you want to. And you can change the uh, copyright settings of videos as well. But most people leave this on the default settings and those default settings from what I have understood from reading through all the legal mumbo jumbo pages about it um, you, you are essentially granting other people the rights to reuse those videos by uh, embedding it on their own website and you know doing kind of whatever they please. I think that's why a lot of people seem to try to put something in their video that, you know, references their own website. You've seen a lot of YouTube videos that are like tutorial kinds of videos, and it's made by a business that actually is selling products relating to that niche. And obviously, they're happy if people take that video and go out and reuse it and share it and do all that kind of stuff with it because it is spreading their logo and their name and building their brand for them. There are a lot of videos though that don't have that information but again most of them still end up being completely legal to reuse. Basically if they're not legal to reuse um, YouTube should prevent you from embedding them. Um, Howard, how would I sell my own ebook on my WordPress site using something like Easy Digital Download Plugin, or is there a better plugin to use? Really, any any plugin like that where you can connect it up to automatically deliver the product and especially some kind of email that can be sent out to the customer. You know, you want it to be hooked up to like your PayPal account, for example. So when somebody buys your ebook, you get the payment. It automatically sends them to get access to it. As long as it can handle that whole system for you automated then it is uh, quite okay to use. Even if you're selling your ebook on your own website though, something you may consider doing as long as you don't need more than ten dollars for your ebook is to actually sell that ebook on Amazon as well. I've used ebooks on Amazon with a lot of success in the past and uh, even sometimes use it for things like lead generation because you can put links in your ebooks on Amazon and you can even offer a free preview of those ebooks so you can simply get the traffic off of Amazon seeing your link as long as you put it up towards the beginning of your ebook. 
Let's see, Joseph says, Market Samurai. Yeah, that's kind of the, the one I think that I had tried many years ago. It's been around for a while. Um, there's expensive, he says. There's coupons online that you might be able to search for, and there's quite a big learning curve to it. I mean, if if any, Market Samurai is probably the best to use for keyword research. But again, that would just be if you're absolutely on, insisted on going the automated route. Personally, I just continue to do it manually on Google Keyword Tool and all the other resources that they make available to me. Um, that's a good question, Mal. Who do I go to for up-to-date SEO, et cetera, information? Most of my knowledge that I have is based off of my personal experiences with running my own websites over the years. I am, sometimes it takes me a second to remember how old I am. I'm almost 32 now, I'll be 32 next month. I built my first website made my first, oh, I take that back, I made my first dollar on my first website when I was 13 years old. And so obviously I've had a long time to experiment in that regard. When you don't really have the time to do the experimenting anymore, which has kind of come more into play in the last couple of years, I still try to do some experimenting still try to build a new Amazon, Amazon site or two each year to make sure my strategies are still effective. Beyond that though, I also attend a number of marketing conferences every year. And uh, those really work well in terms of keeping you up to date with new trends in the industry and big things that might be happening in terms of SEO and affiliate marketing and just kind of depends on the conference that you go to as well. Those however are not really feasible for everybody. Most of the people that attend those types of conferences, they either live really close by or they are actually involved in the development of marketing products or training or something of that sort. Because once you add in the cost of the conference ticket and the hotel and travel and food expenses and everything else, you usually end up easily topping a thousand dollars and sometimes can even get into the two, three, four thousand dollar range just kind of depending on the conference and where you're going and how long it is and how nice the hotel is and other things of that nature. So while I find conferences to be great for the knowledge aspect, it's not really something that I can recommend to other people to do. Um, now that I am doing TMAs on Pro, I am going to be continuing to provide new training every time I go out to another conference. Anything that I learn there that I feel like can translate well for Amazon affiliates, and I'll be trying to pass along that information for you guys. Um, I did this recently with Marketing Mayhem in Orlando, and while that conference was really more for JBZoo vendors and JBZoo affiliates, there were definitely a lot of tactics there that can still kind of be applied to situations like being an Amazon affiliate or other things that you guys might already be involved with that are connected with that. So that's kind of a um, rundown on where my knowledge comes from. I also have I have a lot of uh, Skype contacts. I'm on Skype pretty much all the time. And most of my marketing friends, other Amazon developers, and 
even even other marketers beyond that, more in the general marketing niche. I have a lot of those guys on Skype, and we talk a lot about new things that are happening, and there's a couple of Skype groups that I'm in as well for um, product developers and stuff like that, where we sometimes discuss different information like that as well. So I guess more more recently, some of my knowledge has been coming from those guys that have pretty extensive network reach. So in a lot of ways, I feel like my more modern knowledge that I've been acquiring in the last few years is um, a lot more uh, powerful in a lot of ways than what I've been able to achieve learning firsthand for, for many years, but I still try to learn that way. Always try to learn something or another because this industry is always changing and probably always will be changing. Will I be covering anything with ClickBank? Joseph is asking. Um, I'm not a big fan of ClickBank. I it did ClickBank once upon a time, both on the vendor and the affiliate side. And I wasn't a huge fan of it then. And then they started enacting some new policy changes that I think even increased the fees even more. And it was just kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for me. And I have literally never logged into ClickBank ever since then. And... Um, I still have some affiliate links out there that I, I still see every now and again. I get a deposit from ClickBank. But um, I have not actively used ClickBank or even logged into that website in at least two or three years. And my active use was really more at four or five plus years ago range. Um, so while I won't be covering anything ClickBank related, um, a lot of my tactics can sometimes be used with other approaches in terms of other affiliate networks or maybe even to sell your own products. But again, it's, it's not something that would apply to every single different possible situation. ClickBank seems to be a lot like JBZoo in terms of it's basically just digital products that you're dealing with as opposed to the physical products like you have with companies like Amazon and Commission Junction, for example. When you're dealing with the digital products, though, like ClickBank and JBZoo, one of the things that I can give you as a quick bit of advice that took me a long time and a lot of hassle trying to actually figure out or until I came to this epiphany is that most of the people making the sales as affiliates on networks like ClickBank and JVZoo are the people that are actually developing the products. Not specifically the product that they're promoting, but just like with me, how I develop products for Amazon affiliates. And I also will promote other products for Amazon affiliates that I have not developed as long as I feel like it's something that would work well for my customers and would fit in with the way I do my training. Then obviously, you know, I'm one of the prime um, main types of people that, that you'll find referring sales on on those two uh, digital networks mainly. So in that regard, um, your your average person that comes along and says, hey, there's this great product on ClickBank, or there's this great product, product on JBZoo, and I want to try to promote it as an affiliate and refer some sales because I see, hey, all these other guys are promoting it and hey, it's getting a 10% conversion rate or a 20% conversion rate. You always have to consider whether there are 
other factors to it that may not be apparently obvious. When it comes to the digital product promotions, things like uh, bonus offers that are going along with it can greatly increase conversion rates compared with not using a bonus offer. I believe um, the product I was promoting today, on average, it has less than an 8% conversion rate. Um, I believe my conversion rate was somewhere around 34% on it. It's not that my people maybe are more inclined to be interested of that kind of product than your average person or that, that is um, going to it from another affiliate. But, you know, with me at least, it really is more about the bonus. I always take the time to go through these products and to actually try to teach people how they can apply it to what they're doing and with my current training and things of that nature. So they're not just left up to figuring it out for themselves. And things like that make a major, major difference when it comes to the affiliate networks that allow you to do stuff like that. And with ClickBank and JVZoo, for example, you know, you can offer incentives to people for purchasing something through your affiliate link. With Amazon, for example, though, you cannot do that, unfortunately. I wish they would allow that or have some way that you could actually connect up who is purchasing through your links to, you know, give them some kind of extra incentive for what they're buying. It would definitely change the way Amazon affiliate marketing works. But in that regard, if you mess with any of the digital product affiliate networks, you always have to kind of keep that in mind. Because if you don't, if you approach it thinking that you'll get the exact same results that all of the other affiliates are getting, it, it simply will not work out that way. Um, the, the average affiliate will get much uh, poor results on, on those digital products if they did not have um, you know, customers of their own that were used to a particular way they taught things and bonuses they offer and training and things of that nature that go along with it. So that would kind of be my one bit of advice or caution, if you will, for ClickBank or other digital product affiliate networks. Something I didn't realize for many years when I used to mess with uh, ClickBank. Mailing list building is the other thing you'd like to learn, Joseph. Um, I have covered a fair amount of list building information. I believe most of it is in uh, Azon Masterclass 2, if I'm not mistaken. I have a system on there where you can generate your lead sign-up landing pages and things of that nature and give some of my recommendations on how you can go about building a list in a couple different manners. I haven't, I guess, done too horribly much in terms of how you actually would get traffic to your list and get people to sign up to it. You know, a lot of times offering some kind of really enticing freebie is one of the best ways to go, but there are a lot of tactics concerning how you're actually driving traffic to those lead pages. Um, I will try to get into some more information, uh, more advanced information like that as the classes on this site continue them. Okay, you haven't gotten to that part yet, Joseph. That's cool. Not a problem. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're, they're blatantly labeled as email marketing or newsletter marketing classes in Azon Masterclass 2. Um, should be two of them, if I'm not mistaken. And that covers a decent amount of the training, at least what I would consider introductory training and training relevant to 
what most Amazon affiliates are doing.